strange gases in the mine that the canary dies and they knew uh, we have to get out of here. It's kind of an indicator, a warning. Uh, and the Sahel region is our indicator, is our canary. What happens there will happen here, but later. And what we see happening there is, of course, because of the droughts, increasing food insecurity. Which means that these countries in the Sahel region find it more and more difficult to feed their people. And that triggers several things. The droughts and the food shortage triggers migration. So people uh, who have lived for centuries in certain villages, if they cannot grow any crops anymore, if they cannot feed their cattle anymore in those villages, then they have no choice but to move. And that creates migration flows. And there are many studies that are done on, on how this effect will occur. And in most studies, they talk about hundreds of millions of people moving, not from the cell region, but more widely. It will be, bring big migration flows. And if you only see how Europe at this moment is struggling with a few thousand refugees and a few thousand mig migrants, just imagine the problem we will be facing in 20, 30 years. <clears throat> it also causes frictions. They have herders with their cattle and they, they need uh, grounds to feed their cattle. They need grounds to find water for their cattle. Uh, but the same grounds are used by farmers and both the herders and the farmers have to move more south to find these grounds and these grounds are already occupied by other herders and farmers so you can imagine that that will give all kinds of frictions within the country and we see that already happening for instance in, in Sudan in the south of Sudan you see yearly uh, all kinds of uh, cattle uh, related uh, frictions It can also cause a kind of a breeding ground for extremism. And I've seen that in Somalia. In Somalia, we were fighting pirates on the sea. Uh, but yeah, if you're fighting pirates, you're only fighting symptoms of something. If you look at who these pirates are, these are very poor fishermen or farmers who didn't have a choice anymore, who had to sustain their family, who had to earn some money for their family, but they couldn't do it in a traditional way because there were no fish. And there was no farm to have to uh, to sustain. So they are very easy victims for organized crime and for extremism. And uh, that's an, another risky area that's popping up because where are our extremists uh, recruiting their new populations? It's in, in areas where there is a lot of dissatisfaction, where people have no perspective for their families or for their future. And then the step towards easy money is, uh, is a very small step if you, uh, if you have no choice. So that's a, a very dangerous effect that can occur. And the same is for trafficking. And especially in the Sahel region, traditionally, uh, trafficking is kind of a, a big employment uh, area. Uh, but there is a lot of trafficking going on. Weapons trafficking, human trafficking, drugs trafficking. Uh, most of the drugs from South America to Europe go through North Africa. Uh, so that's big business. And uh, organized crime, uh, they, they really like it if, uh, if the local governments are not able to deal with the situation, if there is a lot of friction. If, uh, so the effects of climate change are, uh, are welcomed by them because then they, can, they have more freedom to do what they want to do. And it's easier to find people who help them. So these are all kinds of effects that we will see, including transboundary uh, tensions. And I already mentioned the Nile as an example, uh, because uh, we all want to have that water. Uh, so uh, these are the tensions that are occurring already, uh, but will only increase uh, during the coming period. Another example I would like to mention is the Southeast Asia area. And um, that's another study that we did. Uh, let me see, you saw, saw it here, the middle one, climate security in the Indo-Southeast uh, Asia area, Pacific area. And what's interesting here is it's a huge area. There are 2 billion people living in that area. It's from China to India. 
And China and India have the largest populations in the world. And uh, the largest net increase in population will also occur there during the coming period. So the increase uh, is enormous. And they all need water. You know, there's very agricultural and very uh, fishing related. Uh, so they all need the same thing. And interestingly, if you look at how they get their water, the Tibetan Plateau is a source of many rivers in that area. There are enormous glaciers in the Tibetan Plateau, and these glaciers are already uh, sometimes mentioned as a third polar cap. So we have the different uh, poles with a lot of snow and, and glaciers, but uh, the Tibetan Plateau is kind of a third area. And also these glaciers are now melting in a rapid way. And as you see on the map, all these rivers, and the side rivers are not on it, but there are many more rivers that you could depict, uh, of the whole region origin in that area. Now what would the melting impact be? In the short term, short term it would mean more floodings, lots of melting water. On the longer term, it would really threaten the whole water supply of the region. Two billion people depend upon that water supply. It's enormous. And I, I realize that I'm painting kind of a, a doomsday scenario here. <laughs> but this is, a, this is a problem that we are facing that we need to deal with. And it will not be local. The effects of crises like these will be felt here. And, and COVID will be just be a very small example of what we can expect from these kind of changes. And especially when you look at the uh, mega cities, those are the red dots, the populated areas. Because two thirds of the whole world population lives in urbanized areas. Two thirds. And of that two thirds, another two thirds is located along coastlines and along rivers. And that's exactly where the floodings will occur. So these, these cities are threatened by floodings and they are threatened more longer term by shortage of water. And I can only imagine what that will do with those populations. Because if they cannot live there anymore, they will have to move. Where do they go to? Where do they go to? They will have to go to other places in the same country or to other countries in the region. But that will only increase and fuel uh, tensions that are already there. So, yeah, I'm, I'm very concerned about these kind of developments. Now, the next question is, of course, what can we do about that? What can the military, what security sector do? Yeah, I think in the, in the previous slides I've shown that this is more than just an environmental issue, that this is a, an issue that affects economies, that affects societies, that affect our global security. Yeah, so also the security community, and that's my message, needs to see this as a matter of international security. But uh, at this moment, when I look at the white papers, for instance, the defense white paper in the Netherlands, the word climate change is hardly mentioned. So we don't take it serious yet. That is changing at the moment, but it needs to change harder and we need to be prepared. COVID shows us how important it is to be prepared. We need to be prepared for this and we need to prevent what we can prevent. And there are solutions. Now, what can the security sector do? First of all, early warning and forecasting. Because if, if you show, looked at the map that I showed you, the impact of climate change will especially be felt in fragile countries. The Sahel region, Middle East, Southeast Asia, these are all very poor, very fragile countries. That's where they will hurt most. These are also countries that are hardly capable of dealing with it. They don't have the money to build the Delta works or whatever. Uh, so uh, these are very vulnerable countries. Uh, and these are also the countries where most of the current conflicts occur. As the chief of defense, I was responsible for the deployment of, of the Dutch armed forces, but also in NATO and EU in the wider context uh, for, all, for all kinds of missions. And all these missions were in these kind of fragile countries, because that, that's where the tensions are and that's where conflicts occur. Uh, and so climate change can be seen as kind of a, a threat multiplier. 
And that's how we usually call it. Uh, which means that the security, the intelligence services are already looking at these fragile regions to, uh, to assess a next conflict, to assess the tensions. Uh, and the knowledge that, these that the military intelligence uh, services have can also help to provide more forecasting, uh, to look with the civil authorities, with civil institutes, at uh, how will climate change affect that country, what kind of tensions can that cause, what kind of friction can that cause, how can we help that country to be able to deal with it, to be resilient. So on the forecasting side, I think that the military can help. The security the intelligence community can help. Uh, secondly, is improve resilience. Uh, climate change is also changing in our own country. At sea level rise, uh, we live, part of our country is below the sea level, so we have to adapt. Uh, already we have a Delta Commissioner looking at how we should raise our barriers and how should we should improve our defenses against the sea. Uh, the same is for the military. We have harbors, we have all kinds of vital infrastructure along coastlines. The biggest naval base in the world is in Norfolk, US. Already, the US fleet located in Norfolk has to sail several times per year because the harbor is flooding. That's at this moment. And the real sea level rise still has to come. And large parts of the coastline of the US are very vulnerable to flooding. If the sea level really rises, then Miami City, for instance, will be below sea level. So even rich countries like the US are, uh, need to deal with this and need to adapt. So we need to prove our own resilience in our own countries uh, and also of our security institutions so that they're able to keep on operating, even in a changing climate. But it's also important to build resilience in those fragile countries. The better we can help them be prepared, the better we can help them to deal with this changing environment, the less problems we will face. Which means that we have to include that into our development programs. And if the EU is designing policies for the Sahel region, if the countries like the Netherlands are designing policies for the Sahel region, we need to look at this that it also with climate change eyes. We need to climate proof those policies and make sure that we, we help those countries become more resilient for the biggest problem that they will face in this century, which is this. And that's not a traditional way of development, of aid. Traditionally, we, we help farmers to grow their crops uh, and we do all kinds of those kinds of problems or those kinds of, of uh, programs. Uh, but this is different programs are needed now to build that resilience. And also the military can help there because also the security institutions of those countries need to be able to deal with it, need to be able to, to keep uh, control of the situation. And we can help those security institutions to uh, improve. Humanitarian assistance and disaster relief will be another big issue. Uh, we have seen the, the hurricane in uh, St. Martin a few years ago. I was still in function back then. Uh, and you saw a whole island, all the infrastructure was destroyed in one night. Uh, well, you can imagine if that happens in your village, uh, what uh, the panic will be. Uh, and it doesn't bring the best in people. Uh, people start behaving differently in those kind of situations because they have to survive. They have to maintain their families, sustain their families, and they make other choices. Uh, but we will see that more uh, increasingly. In the US, tornadoes, every year new records of tornadoes going through the country, floodings, etc. So <clears throat> this will mean that there will be a larger call on security institutions to come and help. Because the civil first responders, the firemen and the police, they are also affected by that same tornado. Uh, so they are hardly able to deal with it. And they are not equipped and they don't have the capacity to deal with these peaks. They are uh, equipped to deal with the daily situation. Uh, so in a peak like this, 
additional help is needed. And then there is often the call also for the security institutions, which means that we need to look at civil military cooperation uh, in a different way. And uh, we need to organize that more professionally <coughs> and come to regional mechanisms. Uh, if I take the example of St. Martin another time, then uh, we went to help in St. Martin on our part of the population. On the same island, there's also a French population. France is doing the same separately. An island further on the line, the UK was doing the same. Another island, the US was doing it. And another island, Canada was doing it. And we all worked separately. And the UN was setting up its own programs. Uh, you can do that when it's uh, really an incidental kind of thing. But once it becomes more structural, then this is not very effective. And then you have to sit together and see, hey, how can we deal with this? How can we help each other become more effective and create mechanisms to deal with this, to do forecasting, maybe have uh, stocks in place and uh, capacities in place to deal with it. And how can we do that jointly? Which means that there will be a need for new kinds of cooperating mechanisms. <clears throat> and the last point I would like to mention is the point of innovation, because here is a big part of the solution. We need completely new technologies to produce water and food, to produce energy. And the Green Deal of the EU that I showed you uh, has a very large focus at green energy, <clears throat> which is good because then we can lower the emissions and we can reduce the effects on climate, which is good. But still we have that problem, which I showed you in the beginning, between demand and supply of uh, water and food. And in the past, we have seen many wars on another resource that was very short, which was oil. Now, with the energy transition and the green technologies, wars over oil will become less and less uh, likely. But wars over access to food and water uh, will become more likely, because those are the new scarcities. We also become more dependent upon rare materials. We all have our solar panels to produce energy, but in these solar panels, we use, we use very rare materials. In our batteries, in our smartphones, we use very rare materials. Uh, so there is also a shortage on those kind of resources, which creates new sources of frictions in the world. And this is all big money. This is over billions of, of uh, euros. This is big money, and, and thus it becomes a power play game uh, connected to it. But innovation can be a big solution. And if I look, for instance, at the University of Wageningen, where they are experimenting with all kinds of new ways of producing food, you already see vertical growth. I don't know if you've heard of it, but you can, you can in, inside a building like this, with uh, LED lights, you can grow crops. Uh, and if you have a device that also produces water, which is also already there, then you can create kind of closed circuit systems inside buildings with a constant production of food. Uh, so those kind of technologies can help us solve the problem and come to a new kind of balance in our world to deal with the demand side. I had a, a Future Force conference uh, several years ago where I offered defense as a platform for innovation. Uh, all kinds of companies were there and it, uh, yeah, it triggered all kinds of initiatives. And then one man came towards me. He said, he said the General, I've got, I've got an idea. I want to produce water in the desert coming from the air. I want to extract it from the air in the desert. He was very enthusiastic about it. And I thought, well, sounds good, but the chance that he will succeed is very limited. So I wished him best. And I tried to walk away, but then I realized, hey, I just offered defense as a platform for innovation. And now I'm saying no to a guy. I can't do that. So I said, OK, let's, let's try this. Next week, he wanted to test. He had a device he wanted to test. I said, next week, I'll bring you in a plane to Mali in Africa, and you can test your device on our base. And that's what we did. So next week, he, with his whole team, into the military plane, flew to Mali, traveled to the base, and there he started testing his device. And he succeeded. He succeeded in producing one glass of water per day. 
a device this big with one solar panel, completely self-supporting. A glass of water. Of course, it's a success, but it's not much. <laughs> and it evaporates almost as quickly as you produce it. But he went on with his device, with the help of defense. And he's now able, with a device this big, also on solar panels, to produce 20, 30 liters per day in the desert. Now, these are the inventions that you want to have. And if you make that device a bit bigger, then you can supply a whole village with water. <coughs> and you don't need electricity. With the solar panels, it can be completely self-supporting. Cheap technology. So I'm a firm believer that innovation can be a very, very big part of the solution, and maybe it's the only part of the solution. Because we're changing our behavior, as we see in COVID, we see how difficult it is to change our behavior. And we can try to reduce our consumption, but then still that isn't enough to deal with the problem that we are facing. So we need other solutions. And we need you, people like you, to give these, in, these smart uh, inventors the space and to support them to come up with these solutions. Uh, and that's where we also need to focus the R&D. And these are these are good few good examples that I gave you of, of that it can be done. But I'm sure that if we really dedicate our R&D money to it, like is happening now in the energy transition, then this will pick up at enormous speed and then we can start building solutions to live in a next world. A next world that will be different from our current world, but a world that we can still survive in. But if you go on in the way we are doing now, large parts of the world will become uninhabitable and we will really face big problems, costing many lives. And with having said that, um, I think I've mentioned all the areas and I will close for your questions. Thank you. <laughs> Welcome. Um, let's have a short break for um, 10, 15 minutes. Um, remain seated, please, except for if you have go to go to the toilet or something. But uh, afterwards, you can ask all the questions you have, because I can imagine you have questions. So um, let's start again at 20.55, if that's all right.
Uh, right, it looks like everybody is back, so uh, the floor is yours to uh, ask some questions to uh, Mr. Middendorp. Um, is there someone who has a question? This one. Um, if you talk loud, uh, I think we can all hear you. <laughs> Okay, um, let me repeat this. So <laughs> I don't know if everybody understood it, but uh, the question is about uh, the the fact that it's the more the industrialized world, uh, the companies that have caused the problem, and that that are the, the poor countries are suffering from it, right? Uh, and uh, that doesn't seem fair. No, and it isn't. Uh, but that's the way it is. Uh, I think we all grew towards this situation. Uh, the Industrialized industrialization brought a lot of welfare things. Our level of welfare that we have now is a, a product of that, but it's a it's an enormous luxury that he, that we have built at a price, and that price is what we are feeling increasingly, and will feel uh, more and more during the coming period. And you're completely right that. Uh, it's the industrialized world that kind of made a, a, a race of it, a race for resources and, uh, and, and raised that level. It was not a deliberate bad choice. It's something that we, all of us, have grown accustomed to. Uh, we all want a smartphone, we all want a car, we all want a house. Uh, so we all want more and more and better for our children. So it, it's kind of a growing process, uh, not realizing that it, that this price is also there, and now we be, we become more aware uh, that we re are running into the limitations of it, uh, and those limitations are being felt in those countries who have profited from that industrialization least. Uh, so they they are paying the price, and that feels very unfair, which I can imagine, uh, and I think the conclusion of this should be that. When looking at dealing with climate change and when looking at all these programs, the Green Deal that we are doing, we should not only look at our own country, but also look at those countries that are affected most by climate change. The countries I mentioned, the fragile states uh, that are affected most, that, that don't have these economies to deal with it. Uh, and also there, there is a self-interest for us, because if we don't deal with it, the problem will come to us if we don't help them. Uh, so uh, I think there is an interest at stake and there is a big thing to say uh, that we uh, have a wider responsibility than just a responsibility for our own hometowns and making them very nice and green. Uh, and yeah, I hope some of you will are going to work in the, in the development area, in development departments, uh, that, that you can... Uh, Keep that in the back of your minds when you're designing policies in the future. Uh, but also COVID shows it doesn't stop at our borders. Uh, if you want to deal with it, if you want to prevent it from happening, you have to go to the source, you have to go to the impact areas where the problems are, and we have, you have to prevent it from coming here. If you wait, then the price will be much bigger. And I think that's the way of dealing with it. Um, but there are no legal mechanisms that you can uh, 
charge the, the civil companies to pay that price. These mechanisms are, they have not broken the law. <laughs> it's just the way that the world has developed over time. And we need to undevelop that. We need to change that. And that's the, that's the situation we are facing. And we can only change that if we look beyond our own borders. Does that answer your question? Um, then I have a question myself because I saw uh, at some slide um, that you had about your um, cooperation with other militaries and strategic institutions. Uh, there, were, uh, there was like a land map and I saw the flag of America. And it surprised me a little bit because I thought that Trump um, – Wanted, wanted to retreat uh, the United States from the Paris Agreements. Yeah. Um, is it fair to say that the Ameri American military is opposing Trump on this point? Well, I have I've to explain that the flags I showed you are not representing countries, are re representing people from countries. Uh, so our network is not a political network. It is not a network of countries. It's a network of experts. And these experts come from countries. So we have uh, a large group of military experts, very high ranking military experts from the US who are concerned and who linked up with this network. But it's not formally recognized by the country. So you see in, in the US now a uh, very contradictory movements. You have a national level and the president who uh, stepped out of the Paris Agreement. But in the meantime, you. Uh, all the states are feeling the impact of climate change and are taking all kinds of measures to build resilience. Also the military, I mentioned the example of Norfolk, the Navy base, they feel it. They, uh, there are big airfields, military airfields flooding every year, not operational. Uh, so they feel the impact and they want to become more resilient against this and they are developing programs to deal with it. Uh, so on the state level, but also in different institutions like the military, uh, they acknowledge the problem and they are developing policies to deal with it, uh, which is kind of contradictory with the national policy. And let's hope for a good election. Yeah. All right, is there anybody else? Yeah, in the back, I saw. Well, it's not only about Russia, of course, and you see worldwide that uh, the impact areas that I showed are occurring. Uh, if you zoom in on countries, uh, the effects on a country are very different per country. Uh, the effect on Russia will be different from the effect on Canada or on uh, South America. Uh, and uh, But also in Russia, you see that uh, the, they have crop failures with, with the grain. Uh, it's... it's, it's uh, the biggest grain producer in the world, I believe, Russia. Uh, but not all harvests are uh, are going equally well. And uh, the Arab Spring, uh, there are scientific researches that connect the Arab Spring to the crop failure in Russia, because they were not able to to supply the normal level of crops that they were supplying before. Uh, uh, but it is changing and it can also have positive effect in that sense that our areas that uh, formerly were not very suited for agriculture can now become more suitable for agriculture. Uh, so you see the, the boundary shifting from the center of the world to, to the outsides. Uh, does that mean that we will produce more food? No, the problem will be the same. It's just that the boundaries are shifting. Uh, and it's still the question if you can use that shift to produce more water, more food. In the U.S., in the south of the U.S., for instance, there are large areas where it's very hard to grow crops. Uh, they also have to drill very deep for groundwater to grow the crops, like in the desert. Uh, and so the 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 um, boundary of arable land is is moving with about 200 kilometers per 10 years away from the Ecuador. So uh, the, the the center of the world, the the dry part will become grow, uh, larger and larger, 
and the um, agriculture, the, the the part that you can grow crops, uh, is moving up upwards. Uh, but if you look at Canada, for instance, also there the uh, snow is melting, and you could say, okay, then we can use Canada to grow more crops. But that would mean that you will have to uh, cut down very large forests that also have a purpose. Uh, so it's not, it doesn't mean directly that you have more land available for growing uh, food. Uh, so I'm, I'm afraid it, it does change and some things uh, open new opportunities, I agree with you, but it doesn't solve the problem. And to solve the problem, we need other solutions uh, like the, the technological solutions that I mentioned. Anybody else with a question? Benjamin. Yeah, well, if the COVID crisis stays, some of the measures will, will stay and then you have these effects. But already these effects are, are fading, uh, so they're becoming less and less. And yeah, we, we live in a very globalized world and people need and want to travel. Uh, so the need for traveling will not disappear, I'm afraid. Uh, it's now we uh, keep it to a low, but um, at some moment it will people will start moving again. And it's hard to stop. So I, I believe more in finding new ways to accommodate that, in finding cleaner ways to do that so that you don't have this pollution and can still move. Uh, we, it's a global village. You can't stop that moving. It will it will happen. It will occur. Uh, but uh, if you can do that in other ways, and, we, and the COVID shows that uh, it, it really helps the planet if you do that, <laughs> well, let's focus on that. And um, and very promising is the R&D that is now going on, on on the whole energy transition issue. There are now billions and billions of euros being invested in research and development on new battery technologies, new solar panels, all kinds of new energy supply uh, technologies. And and I'm very convinced in a in in a very. Uh, yeah, I've got a big faith in our ability to uh, come with new solutions if we want to do so. Uh, and that if we want to do so is what's happening now, because now we are feeling the need. And once you feel the need, we start putting efforts in it, we start putting money in it. And then suddenly, if you can create new kind of business cases that are also profitable for our economies, but at the same time serve... Uh, uh, the Green Deal, for instance, then it's a win-win situation. And then you see a new dynamic popping up, which brings bring a lot of change. Uh, and that's what I see happening now in the energy transition. The whole automotive industries are now turning. China is in the lead, by the way. Yeah. China is leading the energy transition. Yeah. Why are they doing that, do you think? Yeah. 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 They're coping with enormous uh, pollution health issue, which can cause all kinds of social issues in the country. Uh, but next to that, they also see that their dependence upon resources from the other side of the world is a vulnerability. And especially in the future when they're running out of those resources. So they, they are chess players. They think generations ahead and we think elections ahead. Uh, so they, they are, yeah, I admire them for that. They think further ahead. Uh, so they made a decision, hey, we need to, to change now. We need to focus on energy transition and we want to become a world leader in that. And that's what they are doing. At the meantime, they're still building coal mines uh, to sustain the current population. Yeah. But the speed with which that is happening is enormous. Uh, the automotive industry within 10, 20 years, it's all electric. 
uh, and the other industries will follow. Uh, the, the more heavy uh, trucks industries will follow with hydrogen or whatever kind of energy source. And then the shipping will follow. And then the uh, airplanes, new technologies for airplanes will also be developed. So you see a change that is, is now picking up speed, which is good. And if you can, can build that same change on water production and food production, then uh, a large part of the problem that we are facing can be solved. So I try to be optimistic. Someone else, Robert. <laughs> Yeah, well, the first region is uh, the, the whole MENA region, which is Middle East, North Africa, where the droughts are already hitting hard. Uh, if you look at the big rivers, the Euphrates River, the, uh, the Jordan River, the Tigris, uh, these are some periods in the year only small streams. They were very big, mighty rivers supplying the whole country. Uh, so they are running out of water. Uh, and that will be very hard to solve. Uh, which means that people will move to other areas where they can find water. Uh, now they can still drill in the ground, extract groundwater, but that only means that the, uh, the whole ground system is becoming less and less fertile, uh, and it's a short-term solution. In the longer term, uh, it's no solution. You're only enlarging the problem. Uh, so in the, in the longer term, it will mean that these people will have to move. Uh, the whole uh, northern African part it will become too dry and too hot to live in. So people start moving. And the other example is what I mentioned is in, in, in Asia. It's uh, That's a bit further away. <coughs> but yeah, I'm not sure if uh, many of these countries can keep on existing in the way they are. Uh, Bangladesh is already coping with enormous uh, flooding issues. In Indonesia, Jakarta is uh, is sinking away. The whole city is sinking away uh, because of extraction of groundwater, by the way. Uh, and you see that in more and more areas that they are becoming inhabitable, which creates migration flows. So I think the Southeast Asia area, but uh, beginning in the in the in the Northern African area, is where you will see the migrations. And it will start with migrations to within the countries towards the cities. Because if in these cities, if they cannot find work, if there's no perspective for them there, they will move to countries next door. And if they can't find it in the region, they will go outside of the region. And so it will uh, kind of have, have a domino effect. Someone else with a question. Yeah, all in the back. Yeah, absolutely. I think we will see new scarcities. In the past, it was oil. Uh, well, with the energy transition, oil is becoming less and less important, which also will have a geopolitical effect, by the way. Uh, because just imagine what, what that will mean for countries who now depend upon the income from fossil fuels. The OPEC countries, uh, Russia, uh, large parts of their economy are based upon that income. If that income falls away, then their status will change and they will react to that and other countries will react to that. So the, the, the bigger power politic play will change because of this. It will also change because we become dependent upon other resources and other resources become scarce. Uh, I mentioned food and water, but also rare minerals are scarce. Now, also there, I hope that science can help us, that uh, we find other minerals that we can use for our solar panels, and that's already also <coughs> being investigated. But you're completely right, there will be a run for other kinds of resources, and that can be a cause of, a, a cause of conflicts. And certainly it will mean that we will have to adapt also on a geopolitical level. 
Uh, the opening of the Arctic opens up a completely new arena uh, with all kinds of resources in the Arctic area that every country wants to have. Uh, new trade routes over the north, ch changing our whole economies. So it, it will bring a lot of changes in, in the balance of power in the world. Is there someone else who has a question? Yes, in the back. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Well, um, there are already all kinds of programs towards fragile countries. If you just look at the Netherlands, we have all kinds of programs for all kinds of African countries. Uh, the countries around us do the same. The EU is doing the same. So there are many, there are stacks of programs uh, aimed at, for instance, Northern African countries. Uh, what we need to do is climate proof these programs. Uh, make and bring some synergy in these programs and, and uh, let's try to, to refocus the programs that we are not looking at helping farmers but that we are looking to help those countries become more resilient against this change uh, so that they, they don't will become a victim against it but that they can survive it. Uh, and that uh, that's the change we need at the EU level and at the national level. So the, the aid programs that we have through our embassies, uh, the economic programs that we have, the defense programs that we have through our embassies, let's combine them and let's uh, let's climate proof them and make sure that the uh, that they also achieve the effect of the the country becoming more resilient against climate change uh, and it's not just military military is, is just part of the solution it's part of the of those programs uh, we have learned in uh, in afghanistan for instance that you really need a comprehensive approach that you need to tackle a problem through different lines you need development you need diplomacy you need defense you need economic support you need uh, civil companies uh, stepping in so through through multiple lines you need to look at uh, how can we help a country become more resilient and that's uh, how we need to adapt our programs. And that's, I had a big discussion with uh, our foreign affairs department on this a few weeks ago. We had a discussion, uh, I did give a similar presentation to all the uh, ambassadors of the Asian region, all the Dutch ambassadors. And they all recognized it. They all saw the effects. And they all saw the need. Hey, this is having a major impact and this will have a major impact in the future. So we need to adapt to that. We need to change our policies towards these countries and see how we can help them um, become more resilient and, and prevent uh, all these risks from occurring. Uh, Yeah, every country has its agenda. Yeah, that's correct. Uh, we also have an agenda. We have our national policies. We have our national priorities. Also in Africa, uh, the countries, the fragile countries also have their agendas, also have their policies, also have their uh, priorities. Uh, you need to match that. Uh, that's correct. And uh, But I think institutions like the EU can be very helpful in that to, to, to synchronize the efforts of countries. Because now we are all looking st through a straw uh, at the same country. And if you can build more cohesion in those programs, uh, then you can create more synergy and then you have much more effect. Uh, and the larger a program becomes, the more you can make it conditional uh, so that uh, the, uh, a fragile country cannot shop between the different programs and, and play with it to, to find, uh, pick and choose what they like. Uh, so, uh, but uh, for that you have to bundle your efforts and make sure that it becomes such a program that you can make it more conditional to really bring the change that is needed without colonizing a country or whatever. But um, now these programs are often being misused and the people can play with it. Uh, if there were development people here, I would have a big argument at this moment, but uh, I, I do see it happening. <laughs>
Uh, I think there's room for one last question. So uh, now's your time, Avia. <laughs> Yeah, I think you're right. Uh, of course, it will cause conflicts, as we discussed. It will it will trigger conflicts that we need to react to, but it will also change the nature of conflicts. And we already saw that in Iraq, for instance, with the coming of uh, Daesh. Uh, they used the scarcity of water as a weapon. So they uh, occupied the dams, they occupied the water supply, which gave them which gave them a lot of power over the local villages. And through that power, they could uh, influence those villages to support them. Uh, so you see that, that these new scarcities like water are being weaponized and are becoming a tool in conflicts. Uh, and that's uh, another element of how it will change conflicts. And another change, of course, is that the climatic circumstances in which military need to operate also changing. Uh, we Military need to be able to operate in any climate circumstances. So we also need to adapt to make sure that we can still do our work, uh, even if it's very hot or very you know, wet or dry. Uh, so it affects us in, ma in many ways. Does it answer it or... Yeah, okay. All right. Um, I think that was it for this evening. Uh, I would like to thank you very much for um, coming and speaking to us. Uh, so. And then I would like to invite my fellow board members to uh, do some announcements. <laughs> which for next Thursday will be a game night on this sort of window to play among us. We can play a new way of the game as a huge ship recently. Um, but we'll, we're a crewmate and we can find out who is an imposter among us. Um, so join us to find out who the imposter is or if you can pull us off. I'm going to have a small check, but I think we can. We also have a beautiful slide to, <laughs> see, uh, to bring this to you visually, but uh, it's not entirely here. Here we are. <laughs> so next Thursday at 8 uh, at this club. Jonas? Yes. And um, next Tuesday we'll have a new lecture which will be online and it will be all about the rise of other criticism, uh, which is between dictatorship and democracy. And uh, Lilian Mosa will tell us all about um, the rise of this new phenomenon. And we will be live on YouTube and Facebook at 8 o'clock. Yes, and uh after that, on the Thursday, I remember today, yeah, the 22nd of October at 8 o'clock, we will watch a Netflix film, the new uh, film by Dave Edinburgh, the Our Planet on Netflix, you can join us there as well. Yeah. And, last but not least, last but not least, um, the week after that, on October 6th, we'll have a new venture, which will be all about the future of our forests all around the world. Uh, we all know uh, the amount of forests has declined dramatically over the last year, uh, decades. Um, and I've been post and had John Nagers who does more about it. Are we time traveling or sex of October? Oh, yeah. sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Everything is possible, so you can try to 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 try to
Yeah, we unfortunately do not know whether this talk of the 27th of uh, October, October yeah. uh, will be here or will be online due to the press conference which was uh, held meanwhile. So we'll let you know whether it will be here or online. Um, uh, and then we will we'll invite you to join us when we're back home. At 10 o'clock we'll start with online drinks and this sort of things. You're welcome. Uh, for now, uh, thank you for keeping your mask on. I'll kindly ask you to do that until you move the building and they have that long just a bit of right from your own crowd at that time. Um, but maybe it would be nice to um, uh, start with